Yeah. We're going to be we're going to be in Luke chapter fourteen tonight. Luke chapter fourteen. I begin reading in verse number twenty five. Uh, the third gospel in the New Testament, Luke chapter fourteen and verse number twenty five. The Bible says, and there went great multitudes with him, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he turned and said unto them, this is the great multitudes that's following him, they're coming after the Lord, um, and and he turns and, and, and says something to them, uh, and you would think that it would be, I appreciate you following me, it's going to be a bed of roses, uh, hunky-dory, name it and claim it, here's your lollipops and and handouts but that's not the message he has for this multitude that's following him in verse 26 he said if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yea in his own life also he cannot be my disciple and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple uh, that's a really good way to win friends and influence people right there isn't it? that's the way to get a following Verse number 28, and which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000 or else while the other is yet a great way off he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace so likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath he cannot be my disciple salt is good but if the salt have lost his savor wherewith shall it be seasoned it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dung hill but men cast it out he that hath ears to hear let him hear I want to bring you a message tonight, uh, the title uh, taken from uh, verse number 28, um, uh, for which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether it has sufficient to finish it. And the title of the message, have you counted the cost? Now, the context here in Luke chapter 14, of this passage of scripture deals with the, the cost of discipleship. The Lord's telling, it's a great multitude. And he's telling this multitude, if they want to follow him, they ought to take a moment and do some math. Get out your calculator, slide, slide rule, pencil and paper, whatever they got back in the day, and write down what it's going to cost you to follow me. Because they're thinking free bread and free fish and free health care, right? heal the sick, right? I mean, uh, raise the dead and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's, that's their motive in following him, this great multitude. But he's talking about discipleship. If you really get to following him and become a disciple, it's going to cost something. The, the cost of salvation is free because it was paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the only reason it is free. But discipleship's another thing altogether. If you're going to follow the Lord and be his disciple, it's going to cost you something. We throw around the word uh, Christian, uh, like everybody's a Christian or a Christian nation or a Christian religion. You know, the Mormons, the Church of Christ, the Catholics, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, we're all Christians. Well, that's a loose word or a loose use of the word Christian. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Acts that the, the, the disciples, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In order to be a Christian, one had to be a disciple. And in order to be a disciple, the Lord said it's going to cost you something. Uh, most people that are considered Christians aren't in the biblical sense of the word. Now, they're saved. I'm not saying they're not. Uh, but in the biblical sense of the, the word, the term Christian, most of us aren't. Technically, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. 
not according to the standard of the, the scriptures here. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven when I die. I love the Lord, try to live for him. But whoo, that's a, that's a rough standard. There in verse 26, he said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoop. How, how many have ever made the cut with that? So you're not supposed to hate anybody. Well, in Matthew 10, 37, it defines, the Lord defines what the word hate means. The Bible defines itself. Uh, Matthew 10, 37 the, he said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Than, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, to hate those relatives, it just means that you love the Lord more than you do them. You say you're stretching it. I don't think so. It's defined again in Genesis chapter 29 and verse 30 and 31, where Jacob loved Rachel more than he did Leah. The Bible says he went in also to Rachel and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. Okay, did he love Leah? Sure, just not as much as he did Rachel. And served him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. You follow me? He hated Leah. That just means he didn't love her as much as he did Rachel. Uh, the love that he had for Rachel made, made the love that he had for Leah seem like hate. And the Lord's saying that the love that you have for God and the Lord Jesus Christ should be so much that it makes your love for your father and mother and sister and brother and yourself seem like hate. It don't mean that you hate them, but it means that you love the Lord more than them. And you can't be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ without loving the Lord more than yourself and your family. Have you counted that cost? In verse 27, he said, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You willing to bear the, the cross of Christ, the stigma and the reproach of the cross of Christ? That, that cross was a cruel public execution of a condemned criminal you know, we kind of like to to pretty it up and decorate it up you know wearing a make it out of gold and put it on a chain and wear it as a necklace or carve it out of a piece of wood and put a leather strap on it that's not the reproach of the cross the reproach of the cross is the stigma of a condemned a murderer a condemned uh, malefactor if you counter the cause um, there's a fellow that came to the Lord one time and said, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest, or I will follow you wherever you go. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Um, you know, if, you, if you're going to be a Christian, a disciple, that's what, that's what the disciples were called, Christians. You you might not have a, a home to live in. You, uh, the choice is there. I mean, you can or can't. It doesn't matter. I mean, one way or the other. But he's saying if you're going to be a disciple, you need to get a piece of paper and a pencil and write down the cost. Consider it. Count the cost of being a Christian. Now, like I said, salvation's free. There is no cost to it. Um, you may have to humble yourself, uh, but he's, <laughs> that's not much of a cost. You have to do that anyway. Salvation is free because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate cost. But being a disciple, that's another thing. Anyway, that's the context of this. I'd like to make a little uh, different application tonight and ask you if you've counted the cost of sin. We live in a, a curious day and age where uh, most folks are concerned about uh, not how much something costs, but like um, how, much, how much the payments they can afford, how much are the payments every month. They're not so much concerned about the cost. 
the thinking is, if you can afford the payment, you can afford the product or the item or whatever it is. My brother bought a car one time years ago, my oldest brother, and um, I was looking at it. He drove it to dad's house with his family. One, I think it was Thanksgiving, we was looking at it. And it was a nice car, station wagon, had kids and stuff and dogs. And uh, he said that when he went to, to buy it, he said the salesman asked him how much of a payment he could afford. And, and Gene Tony said, I'm not interested in the payment. He said, I want to know the, the cost of the car. He said, I'm going to pay for it. But most people don't think like that. It's like, how much can I pay a month? And I'm not preaching against that or for it, whatever. I'm just giving an illustration here. How our as society, how our mind process thinks nowadays. You should look at something the cost of it, like he's talking about here in Luke chapter 14, what's it cost to build this tower? What does it cost to go to war? But we've got this mindset, well, how much can I uh, get this on installments? Uh, not even layaway, man. Get it now and pay for it later. Uh, uh, the government's like that. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute, too. But the people have that mindset about sin. It's like, I'm going to go ahead and enjoy myself with this thing. It doesn't matter what it costs. I'm going to have my fun now. And we'll worry about the consequences later, if there is any. Now, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That wage, you know what that wage is? That's the, the, the cost of labor. That's what a wage is. Um, if you make $10 an hour, that's the price of your labor per hour. It's just exactly like going down to Walmart and getting a gallon of milk for whatever it is, $4 or a dozen eggs for $10. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good example. A dozen eggs, $10. And your wage is $10. You work an hour to go down there and buy a dozen eggs for $10 if you make $10 an hour. It's somebody paying the, 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 the wage so you can buy the product. Pe people don't understand that. I don't know why we're so ignorant economically, uh, but a, a wage is just the, the cost of labor, the price of labor. They put a sticker on your forehead. It costs this much, like they're doing eggs and milk and stuff. That's all it is. Um, and of course, with inflation, well, I'm not going to get into that, but um, and, and that wage is going to be paid. The wages of sin is death. Um, it's, a, it's a cost associated with the pleasure of sin. He said, well, the pleasure of sin, sure, if it wasn't any pleasure in it, you wouldn't do it. There's a cost associated with it. With sin, have you counted the cost? All right, I got three things uh, about the cost of sin or the, the cost associated with it. Uh, first of all, have you counted the cost to your family? What's it going to cost them for your sin? Uh, the Bible says over there in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so sin passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I don't know for sure, but do I? Death. What did I say? Death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I don't know for sure, but I bet Adam didn't sit down with the calculator or uh, Ticonderoga number two, big chief Ticonderoga number two pencil and draw him a column and say, okay, here's the, the, the cost that this sin is going to demand and this is on this side's the pleasure. But he didn't do that. Um, he didn't consider what we're going what was going to happen to his kids and to his grandkids for disobeying God. He probably thought like uh, I've heard some people talk about their pet sin. Well, I'm not I'm not hurting anybody else. It's not bothering anybody else. It's nobody else's business. It's between me and God. Like. It's amazing how people get pious, even with their sins. 
You can't judge me. God's only judge. Yeah, yeah I'd rather you judge me than God. <laughs> He's pretty strict, amen? But anyway, I've heard people say that. What I do is my own business. That's between me and God, or I'm not hurting anybody. Well, that's the talk of a fool. Amen. And if you talk like that, you're a fool with a capital F, a capital O, a capital O, and a capital L. A capital fool to talk like that. The Bible says in Romans 14, 7, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Your living affects other people and your sin affects other people. Amen. The, the first ones that affect your family. I bet you money, David, when he saw Bathsheba and and it was mulling over in his head how he could get her up there to the house and have his way with her. He wasn't thinking, well, if I do that, it's going to cost me four sheep for a sheep. He wasn't thinking that. He was thinking, ooh, ooh la la. Amen. When uh, Nathan called him on the carpet about that thing over there in Second Samuel chapter 12, the Bible says in verse 7 and 8, Nathan said to David, Thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I've anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and this, this part just blows my mind. Nathan said, and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given you unto you. <laughs> I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Such and such things. He said, if all that hadn't been enough, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, Saul's household, his wives, he gave them to you. He said, I'd give you such and such things. What's that? That's a blank check. Let's just come to me and ask me, and I'd have given you such and such things. And that what that means? Is there some other Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew word, that Chaldean, something that might have meant something else? Such and such things. It's just like, mm, here's your ice cream and the whipped cream and the cherry on top. And I'd have given you such and such things. Sprinkle it with sprinklies and syrup, sugar, golden eagle syrup, whatever, man. Mm. If I don't miss my mark, I bet you that David didn't, that didn't even cross his mind compared with what he had, such and such things, and what he wanted, another man's wife. I bet he didn't tally that up. I bet he didn't calculate that. I heard a story about a man one time that was uh, had an opportunity to commit adultery uh, with a uh, a co-worker and um, said he was real tempted and the story goes that he took out a piece of paper and um, took that thing and drew a line right down the middle of it and he put pros on one side of the line and put cons on the other side and on the pros he said mm, that is really I think it feel good pleasurable it appeals to my ego and wrote down a few things like that and then he put on cons and said i'm married it goes against god's law and he had a big old long list of that and he didn't do it and uh, somebody about 20 years later i asked him about that and he opened up his wallet and he pulled out that piece of paper and showed it to him. He had kept that thing for 20 or 25 years. He said, I pull it out every once in a while and go over it and read that thing. He said, the pleasure wasn't worth the cost. He considered the cost. David, when Nathan called him on the carpet about that thing, David got mad. And he said, the man that's done that shall die and he'll pay four sheep for a sheep, for that one sheep, Bathsheba. And sure enough, they, they said, I've sinned. So he confessed it. And Nathan said, you'll not die, but you're going to pay four sheep. And he paid them. The child died. That was one sheep. That's his family. Am Amnon died. That was his son. 
It's the second sheep. Absalom died. That was the third sheep. And then Amasa died. That was his nephew. All family members. Because of what? He didn't count the cost to his family of that sin. Your, your family may just have to pick up the tab for the pleasures of your sin. Um, no, we, we grew up in a, a drunkard's family and um, around a bar, in a bar with Steve's. Is Steve still down there? I know it's not the same place. They moved across the street. We spent a lot of time in Steve's bars. Miners, seven, eight, nine, four, five, six. <laughs> I'll never be <laughs> that in Terry's Pizza. Terry's Pizza used to have a bar on one side and a restaurant on the other side. We was in the bar side. Crazy. But uh, they, um, the, they, they used to have what they call bar tabs. Like, you know, put it on my tab and pay it later. Well, uh, you know, you, the, the tab of your sin may come due to your family. They may have to pick that up and pay for it. I bet, I bet uh, when, when Haman decided he wanted to kill all them Jews, I bet he didn't think about his family had to pay that tab. The Bible says over in Esther chapter 7, verse 10, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Well, that's fine. If you want to be stupid, be stupid. You want to kill the Jews? Take it under your own belt and take your medicine. They, they, they hanged him, but it didn't stop there. It didn't stop with just him. The Bible says in Esther chapter 9, verse 10, the 10 sons of Haman, the son of uh, Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews slew they, but on the spoil laid they not their hand. Verse 14, the king commanded, and it was so done, and the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. I bet if you could resurrect Haman and ask him if the cost was worth the, the pleasure of uh, stroking his ego, if it was worth it, I bet he'd say no. Did you think about that? Did you count the cost, Haman? Whew. Maybe you wouldn't have to pay such a steep price like that, but why take a chance? Why take a chance that uh, you're, you're racking up a toll or a tab that your family is going to have to pay for? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost of your sin to your family? All right, secondly, have you counted the cost of your sin to your descendants? Not just your immediate family, but your... Uh, What's the opposite of ancestors? Descendants. <laughs> um, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, the passage of, on the Ten Commandments, the second one says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. All right. The judge of all the universe just set out the rules right there. Amen. You know what they are. You commit idolatry, bow down and worship images. That's going to cost you down to your third and fourth generation of your descendants. They're going to have to pick up the tab. You know the rules for idol worship. Now, uh, if you considered the cost, have you counted the cost? I've been to some of these third world countries um, that's got a culture of idol worship. Like I've been to Mexico. I've been to Cuba. I've been to Italy, Spain. Uh, there's folks that really experience poverty in places like that. I'm talking about some extreme poverty. I'm talking about in 2010, they're still using outhouses where they can get them. Sometimes just a hole in the floor. Flies buzzing up through the things. What? Why? What is that? 
that's because their ancestors were idol worshipers, and that's a result of it. And the kids are picking up the tab, paying the cost. The descendants are. You know, you think about somebody beside yourself for a change. Think about those that's coming up after you. Um, we want to we want to satisfy our covetousness as a society in the United States. So we stick the bill with our grandchildren and great grandchildren. We we give them the bill. I mean, who do you think is going to pay for the, the the free money that we print up? Who, who do you think is going to pay the bill on the borrowed money? Well, I got to have mine. I ain't worry about that. Uh, yeah, they're going to get into to, in being enslaved, the borrower's servant to the lender, and the interest is the freedom of your children and grandchildren. But I want to have fun. I want to get mine now. All right, count the cost to your descendants. Count the cost to your family. Last of all, I'd like to say this. Count the cost to yourself. What's it going to cost you? The Lord Jesus Christ said over there in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And there's three words in that verse that show you that you're dealing with a, a, a transaction that deals with yields and return on investment. Profit, gain, lose. What shall it profit a man? He should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Uh, every once in a while, I get in at work where they talk about doing a, a P and O statement. So, no P and L, profit and loss statement. And the idea being, if if we do this job, you need to make a profit on it. If you don't, you can't pay your electric bill, you can't pay your wages, you can't pay your insurance, you can't pay all that stuff. There has to be a profit because I have profit. Nasty capitalists, they want a profit. Well, I'm glad they get a profit because they can take part of that and pay me for it. Amen. <laughs> People are crazy, man. But he's saying that uh, that if a single man could gain the whole world and everything in it, all the gold, all the silver, all the platinum, all the palladium, all the diamonds, all the jewels, the Hope Diamond up there in the Smithsonian, all the crown jewels over there in England, if you could get all the power and riches and money and everything in this world and you lose your own soul, you come out on the short end of the stick. You've lost. In Psalm chapter 49, verses 6 to 10, the Bible says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. In other words, once you're dead, the opportunity to be redeemed is gone, that he should still live forever, not see corruption, for he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, this is what God thought about the redemption of your soul, how precious it is. Uh, he said in uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot or without blemish and without spot. Uh, gold wouldn't do it. Silver wouldn't do it. Diamonds wouldn't do it. Rubies wouldn't do it. They wouldn't redeem your soul. It had to be something precious because your soul is precious. It had to be the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer of the book of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. It's a great salvation. Why is it so great? Well, one reason, because the great price that was paid for it, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, how are you going to escape if you neglect that? Have you counted the cost? Senator friend, I'm talking to you. If you're listening to this, 
if you've never been saved, Jesus Christ made a precious payment and offered great salvation for your precious soul. And all you have to do is receive him. What you need to do right now is consider the cost of rejecting that great salvation. The cost is eternity in the lake of fire. I don't think it's worth it. Matter of fact, when I heard that, I came to Christ and received him as my savior because I was too chicken. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to go to the lake of fire. I wanted to get saved. I considered the cost. I like a good deal. And I got one when I got saved. I've I've made some pretty good deals over my life. I've made some bad ones. But the best one I've ever made was getting salvation for free. Eternal life for free. Sins forgiven for free. Get a uh, get out of hell free card. I, you can't beat it. I considered the cost. I'll close with the words of that old time hymn by the same title as this sermon, Have You Counted the Cost? There's a line that is drawn by rejecting the Lord where the call of his spirit is lost and you hurry along with the pleasure mad throng. But have you counted? Have you counted the cost? You may barter your hope of eternity mourn for a moment of joy at the most. For the glitter of sin and the things it will win, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? While the door of his mercy is open to you, ere the depth of his love you exhaust, won't you come and be healed? Won't you whisper, I yield? I have counted, I have counted the cost. Have you counted the cost? If your soul should be lost, though you gain the whole world for your own, even now it may be that the line you have crossed, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray you'd bless your word, bless these thoughts. Uh, we pray that, uh, Lord, uh, those of us that are saved, that you'd help us count the, the cost of being a disciple and uh, count the cost of uh, receiving rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, what it's going to take to do that. And Lord, help somebody that may be lost that's listening to this message, count the cost, Lord, of rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They could gain the whole world and yet lose their own soul and die and go to hell. What a tragic loss that would be. And I pray that they'd come to thee in the free gift of salvation, Lord, before it's too late. Uh, bless your word. Bless this message. We pray you'd watch over us, Lord, as we go our separate ways. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You're dismissed.